Good morning and welcome to this, our sixth Sunday after Pentecost. A warm welcome to our visitors worshiping with us today. Today is a special day for us here at St. John. We have the blessing of being able to participate in a wonderful opportunity to praise God for a servant that is now being commissioned to serve in his church, Wesley Aguilar our sixth through eighth grade teacher today is going to be commissioned to start his ministry and installed as our new teacher. So it's a very special day today indeed. We will follow our order of service which is printed in your worship folder on page number nine. We will begin our service by singing our opening hymn, hymn number 299. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own, dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. 
O oh God, you prepare joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you that, loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today is found in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 28, verses 5 through 9. Here, Jeremiah, the true prophet of the Lord, confronts a false prophet. The false prophet was telling the people that there would be peace, that the exiles would return from Babylon, and all of the treasures from the temple would be returned. But Jeremiah pointed out, that's not from the Lord. That's not what was going to happen. Then the prophet Jeremiah replied to the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord, he said, Amen. May the Lord do that. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied and bring back the vessels of the Lord's house. And may he bring all the exiles back from Babylon to this place. Nevertheless, listen now to what I have to say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the peoples. The prophets from ancient times who came before you and me prophesied war, famine, plague against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace only when the word of the prophet actually comes true, will that prophet become known as someone who the Lord has truly sent. Here ends our first lesson. We continue now by singing the psalm of the day, psalm number 89. It's printed in your worship bulletin.
Our second lesson for today is found in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Here, Paul is asking us a rhetorical question. He wants us to answer it even before he does. What shall we say then? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. We died to sin. How can we go on living in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him by his baptism into his death, so that just as he was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too would also walk in a new life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with him to make our sinful bodies powerless, so that we would not continue to serve sin. For the person who has died has been declared free from sin. And since we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he will never die again. Death no longer has control over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, also consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here ends our second lesson. Alleluia. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Alleluia. Please stand for the Gospel lesson. Our Gospel lesson for today is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 34 to 42. These words have special meaning for us today. As we are preparing to commission a new teacher for our school. Those who serve in the ministry very often are going to face difficulties, struggles, and sometimes even struggles within families because they want to serve the Lord. But the Lord promises to richly bless those who serve him. Do not think that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet 
because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever receives a righteous man, because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, because he is my disciple, amen, I tell you, he will never lose his reward. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Continue now by singing our hymn of the day, hymn number 32, When Sinners See Their Lost Condition. mercy and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ amen our text for today's message is from our second lesson Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 11 I will read once again verses 1 and 2 
What shall we say then? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. We died to sin. How can we go on living in it any longer? So far, God's word. My dear friends, last Sunday, we were looking closely at Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5. We saw that God's grace in Christ is the answer to sin. It doesn't matter how great Adam's sin was. It doesn't matter how great our sins continue to be. God's grace is greater, abundantly greater. And we have that free, full gift of salvation from Him. And now in Paul's next part of his letter, chapter 6, it seems as if Paul is wondering whether or not his readers might be thinking of something. If sin needs grace, perhaps we should just keep on sinning so that God can go on showing us more grace. Just think of it this way. Do you remember the story in the Bible, the prodigal son? Jesus told that story about God's unconditional love for sinners and how he freely and fully forgives. The young man comes to his father and says, give me my inheritance, even before his father has passed. And he receives the money, he runs off to a faraway country, and he blows the money in sinful living. And when he is hungry and destitute, feeding the pigs, he thinks to himself, I'll just go back to my father and ask to be a hired hand. They eat better than I am right now. And I will say that I have sinned. And when his father sees him coming from a far distance, he runs to greet him, and he welcomes him, throws a beautiful coat on him, and throws him a big party. Now, just what if that son would say some months later, you know, that seemed to work out pretty good, didn't it? I went and had a pretty good time. Why don't I ask my dad again for some more money and I'll go off and do it again? Because he forgave me once. Won't he forgive me again? The greater the sin, the greater the grace. It makes sense, doesn't it? Now, Paul raises this question in our text. And it may be in some of our minds, too. We may not want to admit it, but our sinful nature might be thinking this very thing ourselves. Well, if God forgives, you know, even if I do it, he'll forgive me again, right? But that's not the case. Because God is holy and perfect and demands that we be perfect and he must punish sin. And here's the elephant in the room. As if it were standing right here in front of us, sin is before each and every one of us. And we confessed it today. We know it to be true. It's so big and so evident as if a huge elephant is standing right here in front of us. What shall we say then, Paul says? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? Here's that rhetorical question that Paul wants each one of us to answer in our own mind. What shall we say about this then? And Paul gives us the answer. He says, absolutely not. 
We died to sin. How can we go on living in it any longer? And I like the old translation, the one I memorized, the King James Version. God forbid. Absolutely not. The point that Paul is making here can be summarized in this sentence. You are dead to sin. Be alive in Christ. But we have this problem. All of us. It's our sinful nature. Inside each and every one of us, we don't want to take responsibility for our actions. We want to blame others. The blame game. It's not me. It's society. It's even my parents who have taught me. But Paul is telling us something very important today. And it's not going where we had hoped. He's not giving us a free pass to keep on sinning. Listen to what he says. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him in his baptism into death so that just as he was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too should also walk in a newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Forgiven. Forgiven. And we have this. It was first given to us in our baptism. God's grace was poured out on us. And how does he want us to respond? To live, be alive. To live a life of faith. To turn away from sin. Don't do it deliberately. It's like that man who sends a letter to the IRS. He writes in the letter, I'm sending you a check of $150 because I can't sleep. I didn't declare the right amount of money to you. I can't sleep, so here's $150 to make up for what I didn't declare. And if I can't sleep, from now on, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> Deliberately sinning. Listen to this warning. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy at the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? The writer to the Hebrews says, while serving in Africa, I was dealing with a young man who had committed adultery, not once, not twice, but three times. The first time that he was caught in adultery, he came to me and he confessed, and I said, the Lord fully and freely forgives. Now go and sin no more. The second time, caught again, he came to me and he said, I'm sorry and confessed, you're forgiven, go and sin no more. The third time, he came and said, I'm sorry, Pastor. I'll know you forgive me. All I have to do is just ask to be forgiven, and I can keep doing what I'm doing, because you will 
Forgive me. That's what the Bible says. And I thought of this passage. And I had my old Bible with me. The one that I carried out in the, in the bush. And it was beat up and a, a bit tattered. And this man didn't know that the back pages of my Bible had some pages that had been ripped out of the Bible from the index of my Bible. And I took one of those pages and I held it in my hand and I read this verse. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and I threw that paper down on the ground and I stamped on it and ground it into the ground? who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of grace. I think I made my point. But God makes the point better than I can. When we think that we can continue to go on sinning deliberately. We make God's free grace cheap grace and insult our God. We need to be delivered from sin, death, and its condemnation. This is why we draw near with a true heart every Sunday and confess our sins. This is why we cry out, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. This is why we cry out in repentance, Deliver me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And this is when we remember our baptism. For if we were united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united with him in the likeness of his death resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him to make our sinful bodies powerless so that we will not continue to serve sin. For the person who has died has been declared free from sin. Since we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And we know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he will never die again. Death no longer has control over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ. Alive in Christ. I'd like to share with you a verse that speaks to this very thing. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. The grace of God appears, and it teaches us, teaches us. A teacher. I'm thinking forward now. I'm seeing the classroom at St. John and I'm seeing their teacher teaching them the truths found in God's word and I'm thinking of what Martin Luther put in our catechism and I see their teacher saying to them think of it this way the way Martin Luther put it, our old Adam, our sinful nature should be drowned daily with contrition and repentance. And we should die to sin 
and all its evil desires and let the new person emerge and come forth. Just as Martin Luther wrote the very words of our text for today, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. And I see that teacher reminding his students, you know, you were marked with the sign of the cross at your baptism. You may not remember that, but your parents and those who witnessed it saw it, the sign of the cross both on the forehead and on the heart. The mark that you are redeemed. By Christ and he will teach them to remember to bear that mark in their lives to be alive in Christ what a blessing our congregation and our community will have in this young man to teach this truth for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. A people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Amen. Please rise. At this time, I ask you to join me in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which is found printed in your worship folder. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Dear brother in Christ, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of St. John has called you to serve as the teacher of our 6th through 8th grade class. You have been prepared for this ministry by careful instruction in the Word of God so that you can carry out your duties in conformity with God's Word. As an ambassador of Christ, you are to teach the pure doctrine of God's word, to instruct the young in the way of salvation, and always to have in your heart the spiritual welfare of every soul under your care. You are to devote yourself to meditation and the study of scripture. You are to be an example to others in godliness and Christian living, putting no stumbling block in anyone's path so that your ministry and God's word will not be discredited. You are to speak the truth in love, as the Apostle Peter reminds us, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised, through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. 
and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The ability to carry out this calling is not in us, but comes from God alone. As St. Paul reminds the Corinthians, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. The Holy Spirit, who has called you to this ministry, will be with you. In keeping with the word of God and the will of the Lord, you are now being commissioned into the ministry and installed as a teacher at the Evangelical Lutheran Church of St. John. I now ask you, in the presence of God and this congregation, are you fully determined to carry out this work according to the grace which God will give you? I am. Do you believe that the canonical books of the Old and New Testament are the inspired word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice. I do. do you accept the three ecumenical creeds, the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian as a faithful testimony to the truth of Holy Scripture, and do you reject all the errors which they condemn? Do you solemnly promise that all your teaching will conform to Holy Scriptures and the Lutheran confessions? I do. Will you give faithful witness to Christ in the world that God's love may be known in all that you do and say? Answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them and take to heart the very words that Peter said in his second letter, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. The Lord bless you in your ministry. Amen. I now want to speak to the members of St. John Lutheran Church. Brothers and sisters, you have heard the solemn promise given by Wesley Aguilar, a teacher who you have called. I urge you, therefore, to receive him with joy and to keep in mind always what the Word of God expects of you as members of this congregation. Work together with him for our Lord's kingdom so that by your works of service the body of Christ will be built up. Help him by your word and example in teaching the young, remembering how the scriptures urge you to bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Pray for him continually that his ministry among you may be a great blessing, and that he may have a cheerful spirit in all his duties, and provide for his physical needs. For the Lord says the worker deserves his wages. Honor and love him. As the Apostle Peter urges, live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. I now ask you, the congregation, in the presence of God, are you willing to receive him as a servant of Christ? Will you show him love and honor and support him with your gifts and prayers? If so, answer, we will. And we ask God to help us. We will. And we ask God to help us. The Almighty and merciful God strengthen and assist you always. 
Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, we praise and thank you for your goodness in giving us a teacher. Continue to bless our labors here with your word that we may dwell richly in you and in our children that it may be always there in their hearts. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. You may take your seat. I now ask the congregation to please stand for prayer. Let us pray. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cry, hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies that you have given us each day and especially this day with the gift of a worker for your kingdom. We thank you for the gifts that you give us. Make us mindful, O oh Lord, that you provide for us life and breath. We also praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness. And hear, O oh Lord, our cry today for those who are afflicted. We pray today for James Berg, who continues to recover from his accident. O oh God, giver of life, health, safety, and strength, we praise you for having granted James a measure of recovery from his accident. And we pray that you continue to heal him fully. May he daily remember your great goodness, that he may serve you with a life that reflects genuine thankfulness for all your blessings. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we also pray at this time for the family and friends of our dear departed sister, Anita Kaus, who was laid to rest yesterday. O oh Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you have blessed our fellow believer, Anita, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought her to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest at last. Together with all of us, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. And teach us also to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and everlasting Lord, who also taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We sing our next hymn, 477. What is the world to me?
Please stand. Let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. Bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Please be seated. We will end our service now with singing our closing hymn, 422, Jesus Lead Us On. again, a special warm welcome to our visitors with us today. Two announcements before I go to our visitors who are with us today. The first announcement is the virtual VBS enrollment. If you're interested in having a virtual VBS packet, please sign up either online or on the bulletin board and we will arrange to get a packet to you today. Uh, we don't have enough available for those who have not signed up, but if you want to sign up now, please do, and we will arrange to get this week's packet to those who sign up, and we will continue then to have the list for next week. Every Sunday, a new packet of VBS materials will be given out to those who want to do the virtual VBS program. The second announcement 
Uh, we're playing softball today, our social distancing softball. Please, if you want to play and watch Pastor make a fool of himself, uh, come along at 2 o'clock here on the softball diamond. We have a special, special servant with us today, Wesley, and I'd like to present to him his certificate of commissioning. If you'd like to stand up, Wesley, this is your official certificate from the church that you have been commissioned as a minister of the gospel. The Lord bless you as you continue to serve him. We also will have the opportunity to meet Wesley's family, who are with us today, together with his fiancée, Ella, if you haven't met her yet, and her family, they're also with us today. So if you're able to stay for a short fellowship outside, you're most welcome. We have some donuts, we have some coffee, we have some juice for the kids, we have water. I'm going to ask that Wesley his family, Ella, and their family can be ushered out first. I know it's going against our protocol, but that way they can be the first uh, to be greeted outside. I'm going to ask that if you want to take something as you go outside, please do. If you want to go outside first and then come back in to take something from the table, then you're most welcome. The Lord bless you all today and keep you safe. Thank you. Thank you.